Forensic geologist, author, and TV host Scott Walter is best known as the host of America on Earth. But he's also an inventor of archaeopetrography. I don't know if I said that right, Scott, so sorry. But basically, it's a process used to date and understand the origins of inscribed stone artifacts. And when he's not doing those investigations on ancient artifacts, he's also involved in things like analyzing the fire damage to concrete at the Pentagon after September 11th. He's uh, helping the Las Vegas Police Department investigate homicides where the victims were buried in concrete. <laughs> and aside from that, he's all over the globe. He's an author of several books on geology, the Knights Templar. He is a Knights Templar. He's a Mason. He's a brother of mine and a frater. He's come up with all kinds of great research, and he's all over the globe making it happen. And Haley, his friend Haley, she is an archaeologist herself. She's an author. She's a global explorer. She's into uh, archaeoastronomy, the ancient goddess lore, ancient megalithic sites, which... This is awesome because I'm talking to Scott and Haley in Scotland. They're getting ready for the tour that they're putting on this June 5th through the 12th, 2022 in Scotland, where you can go with them all over to these amazing ancient sites. And then you get to hear two lectures by Scott Walter and get to go to the bar. <laughs> this is going to be an awesome time. I was so fortunate to sit down with them. These are amazing people, and I hope you enjoy this. We got to get after it while we can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's what you guys are doing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it was, I mean, it's a good segue. It's a good way to edit it, but I mean, wow. I mean, thank thank God for you guys. <laughs> so what is going on? I mean, uh, Haley, uh, you know, I reached out and said, Haley, you know what's going on? We've been keeping in contact. And she's like, Scott's coming over. I'm like, what? Uh, and, you know, I talked to you earlier in the year, Scott, and you were, you know, kind of alluding to some of the research that you'd been doing. And I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I, in my head, I'm going, I see where these two things are coming together. And now they're happening on the continent. So, yeah. Well, you know what? It, it's it's been it's been a really um, challenging time. Well, obviously, for everybody with COVID and everything else that's gone on. But um, the research has not stopped. And right. In the last two years, there has been a watershed of new documents, new material that's come forward that is um, filling in all the gaps in a way that we just couldn't imagine. And so, you know, it's 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 like we want to get out there, but there's also this like hold your horses, we can't quite go yet. And right. so, you know, I've been you know, working with Haley on, on certain aspects of this research. And she's been over here for God, almost six months now, right? Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, she came up with this idea of doing a tour and would you be willing to, you know, work with me on this and, 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 you know, be the other face of this. And I said, sure. Why not? I mean, right now things are, are just not happening. And mm -hmm. Really, what's what what is happening, and and we've been checking out here over the last few days is there is some key parts of this Templar story that we're working on that we're right in the middle of right here, and we're going to these actual sites that we've only read about to see if things make sense, and things are making sense in a way that you can't imagine. <laughs> That's so awesome. Good. Not only that, but these sites that are, um, you know, so important are going to be some of the sites that we're taking our guests to on this tour right. in June. Which is even more amazing. It's like, hey, here's some of the most uh, <laughs> top of the list of historical sites of significance, yeah. not only to history, but for Templarism in general. And oh, yeah. here now you have yeah. a chance to have somebody take you to the actual site and show you the physical site where this is all taking place, which is amazing. I'm, I still, yeah. I'm still like flabbergasted by the whole thing. Haley, when you told me that there's no such thing as trespassing in Scotland as a law. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking Scott's over there now. What's going <laughs> on? I can say I can say firsthand that she's right about that because uh, we have done more than our fair share of trespassing, but uh, but it's not only trespassing in Scotland. So <laughs> no it's well what what would be trespassing under normal circumstances in the United States. But you know what? It's um the, the people that we have run into just yesterday, we were, um, or was it the day before? I can't remember when we hiked to that one beach that had the cave with the carving side of it. Right. So we were out on Isle of Mull. Beautiful. Uh -huh. We'd never been out there before. Super desolate this time of year. Nobody. Uh, our original plans kind of just didn't happen, unfortunately, but everything happens for a reason. Right. We ended up hiking around looking for a, a very off the grid 
cave right on the coastline that had some Christian crosses in it. And so we decided to find this cave and we went walking across this property going through some gates. It was a farm. There's some sheep running around, some cows and some stuff. Some sheep. There were sheep everywhere. <laughs> Water everywhere. Soaked. To the, our feet were soaked. Uh. It was It was challenging. But when I was telling Scott, I said, you know, in Scotland, you're, you're allowed to be walking across property. People expect it. They put up signs saying to pick up after your dog because they just, they, people walk everywhere. There's walking trails through ranches and farms. And so anyway, when we were walking around looking for this, walking back after scouring like miles of coastline and not finding this cave we saw a farmer driving towards us and i said let's ask him yeah. so we asked him and he was the property owner and he said oh yeah the cave's actually on my property up here and he gave us directions on how to get there and just said close the gates behind you whenever you're done yeah. <laughs> that's so awesome you yeah. know here in america that they chase you out with a, a rifle you know anywhere else where <laughs> it's like hey yeah. get out right but they're like yeah, yeah go check out the cave and close the gates behind you yeah. Well, I, I think that these people can figure out um, who you are pretty quickly. And, and they were very friendly. And obviously, we're, you know, we're not, what are we going to do? Steal one of their sheep? What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But um, no, it's, it, this is the way life should be, quite frankly. It's, it was super chill and, and, and literally chill. The wind was blowing. And, so you know, cool. the days are short because the sun oh, just doesn't get very high in the sky. And when the sun did come out, it was like, oh, hallelujah. You know, I, I've, I've learned to appreciate the sun. <laughs> yeah, you can understand where that sun worship Before. came from in the northern hemisphere. At yeah, certain exactly. Parts. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> I know when Haley so, was saying it's 3.30 and it's dark, right? So three, yes. like, yes. yeah, that, that makes for a really short day. It's like, ah. Yeah, wow. yeah so. It does. Although you can sleep in for a long time, you know, it probably makes for a longer night to party, but <laughs> I was going to say the bar is open right away. Right. I mean, they probably never <laughs> close anyway. So exactly. But you got to maximize the, the sunlight. I mean, in all seriousness. And today we had a good day. We went up to, uh, to look at some megalithic sites. Nice. You know, what is so cool about this place is that there are standing stones everywhere. Right. Just, you're driving along and all of a sudden, oh, look in that field there. And there's a little barbed wire fence and there's a standing stone that's 15 feet tall. That's probably been there for three, 4,000, 5,000 years. Yeah. And they're just peppered in the fields. And and, and there's sheep around it, right? And people are just like, oh, I'll leave it there, whatever. The sheep yeah. are everywhere. The sheep are everywhere. <laughs> they're on top and, of the cairn. Yeah. And you know what else is everywhere? Uh, remnants of their being there. <laughs> oh, yeah. When we, when we found this cave, when we found this cave the other day, I was so, we'd been looking for it all day. It'd been kind of stressful. We finally get in there and I'm just busy looking at the carvings and Scott points out, yeah, I think the sheep like this cave a lot. <laughs> <laughs> just, and I was like, oh, I didn't realize. <laughs> sheep <laughs> dung everywhere. <laughs> yeah. No, no, literally, I thought in the pictures online, there was one picture that showed two people at the mouth of this cave and it looked like they were on sand. No. Mm -hmm. It's not sand. <laughs> oh, no, wow. Or the entire floor of the cave oh. is, is sheep shit. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know what? It didn't matter. It doesn't stink. And yeah. man, we didn't care. We just went for it. It was yeah. great. Well, that's awesome. I mean, I'm glad you guys are finding all this cool stuff. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's right there, right? I mean, it's just out in the open. And it's cool that everybody's so amazing about it. It's like, yeah, go ahead. Just hang out, you know? I mean, yeah. some of the stuff that still boggles my mind, and I know you, Scott, you've done research on this, is the whole Egyptian connection to Scotland and, oh, and, yeah. and masonry and, and how that's all there. And it's like, you know, I'll tell people that, yeah, there's an, you know, e Egyptian um, uh, megalithic site there. Everybody's like, you're out of your mind. I'm like, no, it's there, right? And megalithic is probably not the right word. I'm sorry. Forgive me. No, no. I think, I think you're, you're probably right. The Everything we're seeing here dates back at least three to 5,000 years. And, you know, every one of these estimates that people have about these sites and, and even the interpretive materials that we saw today um, at, where did we go to? What is it called? The last site? Scarabre. Scarabre, yeah. yeah. And they were saying that uh, the interpretive materials said that in, in Egypt, the pyramids are 4,000 years old. My God, that is so outdated. Now. <laughs> right. I mean, some of the work of... Graham Hancock and Robert Schock is, well, Robert Schock is a geologist. And so I, I put, and I love I, Graham, don't get me wrong. He's, right, he's right. 
ridiculous. But Robert Schock's work pushes back the Sphinx and the pyramids back to at least 10-5, maybe 12-5 to the Younger Dryas period. Correct. If those things are much older than everybody thought for all this time, what about these sites here? Isn't right. it the same thing? Probably. Um, I think I think it might be. Well, the other Egyptian connection we have, which actually ties into our tour a bit, is one of the sites we visit, which is Schoon Palace, which is where all of the ancient kings of Scotland were crowned mm-hmm. ah. and where the Stone of Destiny was resting. Um, and that's why they were crowned there, was on the Stone of Destiny, which was allegedly Jacob's pillow that was brought over with Queen Skoda, the Pharaoh's daughter. Wow. From- and they Skoda. brought it here. Yep. Wasn't she was she buried there as well, or am I making that up? But I know there was a there was a monument or tomb that was been, found yeah. there uh, of Fort Tuhur. You, or? you know who's written the most about that? That that um, and it's been a while since I've read it. Brother Ralph Ellis, are you familiar with Ralph Ellis's work? It's been a long time, but yes, I think so. Okay. That was early on in my days. And I'm trying to remember. Yeah, he's he's written a lot about uh, about this type of this subject matter, and and I read his books uh, Skoda and. I can't remember the rest of it, but anyway, he has them coming over here, and I think they did pass here. They and they because that's where the name of the Scots came from, and it was her husband that. And I think he yeah. was a Greek. Was he a Greek king or prince? And I they don't recall his honestly. name was Galathos. Galathos, I think, and that's where we get Gallic from. The ah, Gallic yeah. And they they first went to Ireland, and then they'd come over to Scotland. They had migrated over, and those people were the people of Queen Scotta, so that then were the Scots. Mm-hmm. Which is amazing. And you tell people that now and they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> they think of the, you know, well, the modern you know, Scottish think, tradition and they have like no connection to the Egyptian side of that. Well, what, what I, the thing about the British Isles that I think is really important that people don't think about when it comes to all of this okay. contact, you know, in the Americas and from Egypt to the British Isles to here um, is, is the, uh, the bronze age is really important. And, you know, you need two things to make bronze. You need copper and you need tin mm-hmm. and the largest tin reserves in the world, natural deposits of, uh, reserves of tin is in the British Isles, uh-huh. right? Okay. The largest pure by far deposits of copper are in the upper peninsula of Michigan in Lake Superior. Remember that. Um, you know, the copper culture has been talked about ad nauseum and still academia does not accept the fact that there were, uh, you know, people from Europe and the Middle East that came over here to collect copper. And you got to remember something after the glaciers melted back, the copper was l- just laying on the on the ground, which is you amazing. Yeah, pick it up. I mean, and it was ninety nine point nine percent pure copper. In some places in the UP, you had copper and silver occurring together. The wow. only on the planet where they occur together and you can just pick it up off the ground. It's <laughs> amazing. So, um, it makes sense to me that people could have traveled over here and on the way back, they stop in the British Isles and pick up the tin. And now you got, co- you got bronze. And so, on, And on that note, Joseph of Arimathea had also traveled to the British Isles and he was a tin merchant. He was a tin merchant, right. And he had gone to Glastonbury and that's why Glastonbury Cathedral, um, there's a well there. And I think it's called the Grail Well because the legends of the Grail obviously traveled with him when he allegedly brought the cup of Christ, the cup of Christ to the British Isles. Right. Right. So so my, my point is, is that you hear about these legends and it's like, oh, they came over here. Uh, you know, in the first century and, and afterwards to the British Isles for what reason? Well, there was probably a strong economic reason why they mm-hmm. were coming here or that they had come here. They knew about this place, that it was important. It was sacred. But I think we we have to think from a practical standpoint, um, you know, above and beyond sort of the uh, uh, the fanciful, you know, thinking yeah. they come here. There's practical reasons for that. Same way we go all over the planet right now, natural resources, right? We're looking for oil, we're looking for gold, we're looking for any of these things. Absolutely, absolutely. Which is amazing. You know, it, it ties back into, I always think about when we I, uh, talk about metallurgy and things like that and, you know, tubal cane and things like that from our craft and, you know, um, uh, rotting and iron and brass and all, all, and all of those things. You know, I always heard stories when I was a kid, my father used to tell me, you know, there was copper swords that have been found that are so sharp. And today, even today, we can't duplicate these copper, you know, swords for some reason. So there's like this lost art of metallurgy that's basically known. Alchemy. 
And yeah, exactly. It's kind of what it ties <laughs> into the whole thing, right? So it's like, well, where does that whole play uh, and everything? And um, it's just amazing that when you when you just look at the archaeological aspects of it all, where you can see these written in stone, written you know the artifacts, and, and you can p- place it together without the fanciful. But then you add the fanciful parts on there, and then the oral traditions that are handed down through millennia, right. and it it all makes sense. It's like, well, you know, why would you make up all these things? No, this is just the way that everybody understood it and has been communicated forever. And you can go to these places. You could go to Scotland. You could go to these caves where you know these things happened, and you know some of them are are, are marked right. This is a historical landmark, and some some of them are full of sheep shit, but but they're there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it doesn't make them any less important. Exactly. Does. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's so, so you cool. You know, one thing that I think uh, would be fun to talk about here, because uh, obviously being a Mason, you'll appreciate this. And it, it, it didn't really hit me until I was actually in the lodge. But we visited and met with a couple of brothers, a couple of past Masters of the Lodge of Kill Winning Lodge Zero. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Mother Lodge, period. Yeah. <laughs> and it there was, she it is. Was, <laughs> there we go. There we go. She's in the background always watching me. I love it. it keeps keeps you within new bounds. Yeah, that's the divine feminine hiding from behind the uh and there the apron. you go. So she's hey, behi- speaking of that. Yes. Of that, yes. Um, there was something really, really uh, interesting that that we found that uh, really dovetails with Haley's work and the book that she's writing and finishing. Right. <laughs> it's an amazing book. I remember reading all you know what you gave me, and I'm like, "When's it at?" Well, I'm working on it. I'm like, "Yeah, I've been working on it quite a lot since we've been here as well." So, yeah, well, but the I book will never end. It's an amazing book. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, it is. It's really good. And I think I think she may have found her ending, which is um, an ending that I've been working on for a while myself. And that is, you know, uh, just take a step back. We've been working with these new documents, right? Right, right, right. That has uh, become obvious in my work and and other people's work uh, is this whole concept of the sacred feminine that has been suppressed by the Roman church and how the, the Templars had to, uh, you know, honor and venerate um, the Mary, right. Uh, mm-hmm. In secret or right. Under her veil. Right. Uh, and so that has always sort of been the undercurrent of what I've known there to be, uh, to be there a big part of their ideology. And that ideology we see in these documents went all the way through and continued to the time of our founding fathers. Right. The Venerated the sacred feminine as well. And we see evidence of that in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. just like the top of our Capitol Dome, right? Yep. Persephone, right? Freedom. But what happened since then? Well, what's happened since then to the present day within Freemasonry is that she has been pushed into the shadows. She mm-hmm. has been veiled. And frankly, I, I don't know really any brothers who truly understand the fact that she is still there. Mm -hmm. One of the claims that I am about ready to make that I know a lot of brothers are not going to be happy with. They're going to be, they're going to be upset, especially (laughs) certain parts of the country. Uh Oh, but um, I'm going to make the claim that the goddess is sitting in the East of our lodges. Oh, Wow. I know a lot of past masters are just falling over right now. And masters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're going. Right. So that was that was a hey, there you go. You better take that take so that, bring it a little that, closer. Uh, <laughs> take that uh COVID mask off her, will you? There. Yeah, yeah. She does I think she needs to get it down here. There we go. There you go. Wow. No, seriously, and, and and let me just say that the evidence is all around us. It's just that people have forgotten. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm gonna do my whole lecture, but you know. How many people understand the origin of the five-pointed star? None. Okay. Would you not agree that it's arguably the most iconic symbol of our nation, the United States? It is, and it's masonry, and it's Venus, and it's a lot of other things that people don't seem to understand, right? Well, most people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. And so we walk into Kill Winning Lodge, right? Zero. Lodge zero. 
Lodge, thank, Lodge Zero, right? Thank you for sending me the picture. I'm going to post it here, by the way, of you guys at Lodge Zero at the, on the yeah, East. Yeah, absolutely. Lodge. Okay. Yeah, that was awesome. So the first thing we see on the stoop is this beautiful, ordained, uh, you know, ornate with flowers and foliage, five-pointed star in the stoop, right? Mm -hmm. so as soon as we walk in, I'm going, okay, we're off to a good start. <laughs> awesome. And, not even in the building yet, right? You're just right there. We're not even in the building, right? <laughs> and, you know, you, you also have to understand that I've been to a lot of lodges. I've traveled around the country, given a lot of lectures, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen, in addition to the beautiful black and white Masonic pavement, I have seen usually right in the middle of that pavement, or oftentimes a five-pointed star. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's on the eastern end of the lodge. Right, right. So what are we talking about when they talk about the three lesser lights, right? Those are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the sun. The moon and the master of the lodge, right? right. Mm -hmm. That sits in the east, right? Mm -hmm. So, if we're talking about heavenly bodies after the sun and the moon, what would be next? Uh, Venus. Probably Venus. <laughs> it's the brightest so star. It's always in the east. By the master of the lodge, right? It is. I'm and just saying. If you notice in that photo I sent you, you can see her in the east, proudly standing up on the yeah. ceiling. And, you know, yeah. up high in the lodge, in, in the east end of kill winning Mother Lodge number zero, is a five-pointed star in the eastern sky just sitting above the master of the lodge. Amazing. And when you look at the east, what do we see? We see this blazing star. The blazing star, right? Right, we right. Do that verbiage in our ritual. Mm -hmm. See this glowing G symbol. Yep. And what does that G stand for? Well, you know, that's been debated for centuries, right? I mean, we kind right. of know what it is, but I mean, a lot of people have their own interpretation of it. I've heard Mason say five different things for what it means, um, you know, to everybody. And um, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, everybody has their own interpretation i i mean yeah you know and i've, and I've asked guys like you know 80 you know, guys that were in their 80s and 90s and you know members since forever and generational and and, and they all tell me different stories so mm -hmm. you know what what does it mean does it mean geometry <laughs> does it mean god does it mean goddess i mean uh, gaia could be gaia yeah well, you know, the, the thing that's interesting is that if you go back to the five-pointed star for a second, you realize that embedded within that symbol is the uh, the golden ratio, the Fibonacci sequence, right? Right. The basic uh, blueprint of all life in the universe, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's symbolized by the spiral, right? Yep. And, you know, the galaxy is shaped like a spiral, a hurricane, when you brush your teeth, the water goes down the drain. <laughs> I mean, so if if that's what's symbolic of uh, of deity, mm -hmm. and it's a mathematical constant, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do we call deity and Freemasonry? Oh, the great architect of the universe. Hmm. Architect. Mm -hmm. which when you think of architecture, what do you think of? Math. Geometry. Geometry. Astronomy. Astronomy, of course. You see a connection kind of coming here? Huge connection. Huge connection. I mean, some yeah. of my research brought it back to the, the the rope tires, you know, some of the early forms of masonry. You know, they tie knots into ropes at certain intervals. And then right. with the line with constellations, they could, you know, line up, a, put a stake in the ground with you know, serious or something, right? And then you can get perfectly, right. perfectly right angles all the time. So you would tie that right. rope off and count how many knots to the next one. And then you could always completely align your structures to, you know, a cardinal direction based on the stars. And that was one of the secrets that, you know, was later uncovered, I guess, through masonry throughout right. the, the Gilded right. Age, where they would, you know, have this, have this knowledge. So they're out there sneaking around at night and everybody thinks, what the hell they're doing at night? You know, well, hell, they're lining up to a star. <laughs> that's, what they, that's, how they're, <laughs> that's how they get a right angle on this building. And it's right every time. And it's, you know, and it's definitely pointed to exactly. you know, the solstice or anything like that, too. So that's, 
you know, all that hidden knowledge, but it was there for a reason. Well, we're, and, and, and what we're seeing when we drive around up here, in this case in Orkney and, and really all over Scotland, is you see these ancient standing stones and these stone circles. Um, why did they do that? I mean, it was for the exact same reason, right? Yeah. It, was, or it was part of their cosmology and, and their, their ideological way of life was to connect with the heavens, right? Right. But was not only this spiritual aspect to it, but there was a scientific aspect to it. There is a scientific aspect to it that really um, goes to the heart of our craft. And um, I, I guess for me, what is um, important to try to get across, and frankly, I'm not even sure what the right way to do it is. It's, it's, this is a difficult thing. But one thing I can say with absolute certainty is from the time of our founding fathers, yep. all the way back to the Templars and beyond mm -hmm. is that there was absolutely a, um, a value placed on this aspect of the sacred feminine. Mm -hmm. There was a reverence for the sacred feminine for, for multiple reasons, a respect and, um, and reverence. The word is reverence right. and that's been lost, right? Since the time of our founding fathers to this day. And, and frankly, right now, I think that this knowledge that we're working on, especially with a sacred feminine right here, <laughs> yeah, a goddess, well, yeah. um, to be able to to bring this back, um, not just to our craft, which is really important, but once we bring it back to us, then we can get it out to the world. I think that's our responsibility. I think now, as Masons, more than ever, we need to step up and and educate. Because mm -hmm. um, frankly, we've talked about this before too. Yeah, uh, we're having fun, and all this is great and positive. But there are some real difficulties in the world right now, and I think more than ever, we as um, I, I look at Freemasonry as the leadership. Look, right. our founding fathers set the table for us, and now the table is filled with some stuff that shouldn't be on it. Yeah. And, uh, it's up to us to to uh, clear that off and get back to where we should be. So that's also a big part of what's behind not just what I'm doing, what you're doing, but what Haley's doing and what other people that are doing this research is is our job is to uh, to make the world a better place, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's the the ultimate goal, and I think. Haley has more of a responsibility than us. We can open the door. <laughs> I think she's the one. I think it's all on your shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> we can just open the door and go, here Here you go. Well, let's put it this way. She's going to be here a lot longer than you and I are. You got that right. You got that right. Yeah. No, and so, I think it's it's. I think that the only way to turn it around, and we've talked about this lots, Haley, is, is the, the female. I mean, I think the, the divine feminine needs to rise back up again and really take the reins, you know? And like you said, Scott, there's going to be like, you bring that up in any lodge meeting, <laughs> there's going to be guys that'll just want your head. You know, they're going to be like, what are you talking? Like, is he off his meds? Like, what's going Like, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be like, what? Does he have early age dementia? Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Did he hit his head on the way in? What's going on? Yeah. Well, yeah. I hit my no, head plenty, but. Yeah, no, no. I mean, but that's it, though. I mean, once you get down to it, and everybody knows it. I mean, you can't tell, deny that feeling that everybody has. I mean, and that's the thing. And I think that's, you know, you and I have talked about it, Scott, and I think, Haley, about the, you know, the coming of age, you know, where Zodiac, uh, you know, and my English is not very well, I'm sorry, but, you know, the Zodiac switches. So we're into the age of Aquarius now. If not, we're really, really yeah. close. We're on the precipice, right? If we're not, we're already in. Uh, some of my brothers have we're said transitioning. Yeah. Yeah. We're in that, that transitory phase. Uh, you know, a couple estimates were, you know, mid last year or something like that, but regardless, we're getting there. Everything's changing. Everybody's having a different attitude. You know, there's a, a lot of upheaval uh, everywhere in the world, but you know, still everybody still was looking for the truth, you know, and I think the truth will always come out. Like it'll resonate yeah. with you, you know, no matter what. And I, and I think that the divine aspect is hidden. And I, I often wonder though, too, is it, if that had to have been completely directed, you know, the Templars set this up from everything I've learned from you, Scott, and all your research is that, you know, in the 13th century, they set up this grand experiment we call America, right? Or begin the foundations of it, right? To make this what it is today. They were over here pre-Columbus, obviously, right? Who's Columbus? Um, you know, uh, forget it. They've been here, what, 1327, maybe give or take, you know, maybe probably. Oh, no, they were coming over here in the middle part of the, well, you know what? You got to back up because 
Um, Sorry, I get excited and I just fly right through it. <laughs> well, this is this is part of the story that that has sort of hit me in the head as a, a aha moment here, not too long ago. But really, we're talking about a continuum that goes back really thousands of years because those those early copper culture people ideologically, I think, are. Um, the Templar descendants of those people, right. um, the early Hebrews that were here that that carved the Bat Creek Stone, the Tucson lead artifacts, the Newark Holy Stones. Um, these are clearly Hebrew from right. around the time of the first century. Um, you know, America has always been, or I should say North America, has always been a place uh, a, a sanctuary. They called it a sanctuary for people that were suffering from persecution. Right, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, people that were marginalized and and, and um, tread upon just simply for what they believed, right? Mm -hmm. and the Templars absolutely fall into that category. So I don't think that they discovered America. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, right. the, Scottish, the Scottish Templars that we're researching right now, the Earl Henry and and all of them, they are uh, descendants of the Vikings, right? right? I mean, I think they knew about North America. The Vikings had already been here. How did the Vikings know? Somebody before them. Mm -hmm. And within these um, uh, these orders, if you will, or these societies of certain people that were in sailing circles, uh, early Freemasonry, whatever, you know, whatever form it was at that time, mm -hmm. were aware of this ancient knowledge of the land to the West. If right. you followed the blazing star to the West uh, when she's an evening star, the land of uh, America. So I don't think this began in the 13th century, the 1300 by any means. We have records where they have been coming over here as early as the late 12th century right. in the 1170s. And, and I, I have to tell you that I don't think that the crusades that were fought when the Templars went and captured the Holy Land, really all that was was establishing, in my view, a base of operations so they could round up the stuff that they needed in the region, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Later on, uh, in the latter part of the 12th century, people, you know, historians will tell us that the Saracens, you know, defeated the Templars and drove them out. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that for a second. I think they got what they wanted, and it was a, uh, a withdrawal. Right. Uh, well, there's a mutual exchange. I mean, some of the brights in Freemasonry, when you get into the higher degrees, I mean, even have these tales that are like, oh, hey, uh, you know, the captured Templars and Masons and they indoctrinating, uh, you know, the other cultures, the Muslim cultures into Masonry and Templarism and vice versa. So they were learning. Or ancient, vice versa. Vice Maybe versa. They were initiating the Templar brothers with new information about technology, science, navigation. And stars, the astronomy, and everything. Stars, yeah. And not yeah. only that, but the Knights Templar, they were the special forces of the era. And they, the knowledge that they had, their mm -hmm. battle tactics, their training, that came from the Saracens. That came right. from those people. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. There was all that's why we everybody thinks that, oh, you know, one one group battled the other. Well, no, there was definitely some kind of camaraderie where, like, well, you know, I recognize you as a knight or as a brother, you know, something, you know. So there was still that whole uh, passage of knowledge between the two. It wasn't just we're going to kill everybody and everything's dead. It's no, there was like right. smart, educated people that knew, you know, that were not heathens, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that carried on no, traditions, no. And, you know, and and that's where a lot of this stuff comes in. And that's why masonry today is this kind of loose conglomerate of all kinds of esoteric traditions, hints, hints and little, you know, peppering of, of everything in there, which I think is great. You know, most people, like you said, they don't even know what the Eastern star, or the, 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 the star is in the lodge. Well, how are they going to figure out that some of the things they talk about came from a Saracen <laughs> yeah. in exactly. the, the first well, century? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's but but that's also the fun thing about Freemasonry too is, um, I just love the whole concept of seeking additional light. Right, you can right. go become a master mason, and then if you're really enjoying your experience, you want to learn more. You can do the Scottish right, you can do the York right, and then there's all kinds of fun stuff on the side that yeah. you either pursue or maybe get invited into. Yeah, that's that's, that's where the really, Rosicrucian stuff comes in, which is awesome. The SRICF. That's where I've. By the way, I was just uh, I, I was just invited and I accepted, and I am I am now uh, a member of the North Dakota uh, Rosicrucians so College. I'm, All right. Well, congratulations, friend. Pretty excited. <laughs> yeah. The funny part was I had my my first lecture that I listened to. I think it was uh, no uh, October. 
And then at the end of the meeting, they said, okay, uh, freighters, um, who would like to give the next lecture? And somebody volunteered me. So oh, yeah. I gave the next lecture about three weeks ago. It was my second second meeting ever. And, and I gave a lecture, but, awesome. but it was fantastic. Aren't those some cool guys? I'm honored to be. Oh, it's so great. I can't wait, man. That's that's such a cool college to get in that. And, it's, you know, it's called a college because you're learning, you're studying, yeah. you're giving research, you know, you're, you're exactly that's what exactly. The, the greatest part about that is. And that's like, that's when I became a Freemason, I thought was happening. And it took me a long time to find it. But man, you know, it did find me. Obviously, you can't go find yeah. it. <laughs> it just comes yeah. to you finally. But and you know, you know, what's too bad, though, is here's a really smart person right here. And a young person that um, is just filled with energy, uh, you know, brains, beauty too. I mean, she's got it all going on. And why, why can't we have something a little bit higher level for uh, somebody like her? And there's a lot of other women that would bring a lot to our, to our craft. And I'm not saying we have to, you know, change anything, but it's kind of sad because here we are, when we realize we get to the end of that rainbow, so to speak, we realize that sacred feminine right behind you, who's literally right on your shoulder. She's always there. Yeah. Um, you know, why can't we get more from them? Yeah. Well, I, and that's what a lot to offer. Oh, huge. And one of my thought process was that when you when were, the founding fathers were here, do you, I had to have been purposely hidden in order maybe to appease the church. You know, in some way, in my mind, I think no that way. And I, there's no doubt about that, brother, that, mm -hmm. that church was the issue mm -hmm. and they have been the ones that have marginalized the feminine for almost 2000 years. And it's tragic. And this is one of the things that needs to be changed dramatically. And um, I, I can't think of a better person who's in a position to take it into the future than this this woman right here. She's she's amazing. So Haley, are you going to be the first master mason, fem female master mason to sit in the east? Well, wait, 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 wait! Hold on, hold on. Can you keep a secret? <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Then. A lot better than some guys I know. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, you know, and speaking of the, you going back to the astrology aspect and talking about um, going into the age of Aquarius. One of yeah. the interesting things I find is there's so many different ways to interpret the Bible. And one of my favorite ways to look at the Bible is, uh, you know, through the lens of astrology. And that being said, Aquarius is always associated with Mary Magdalene because sure. the cup bearer, the water bearer, the grail bearer, and mm -hmm. Jesus is always associated with the age of Pisces being the Fisher King. Right. At the, at the end of the age of Pisces comes the age of Aquarius. Right. And it's right. it, like the Bible. And when Jesus dies, who is supposed to be carrying on his teachings? He tells Mary Magdalene, or the you know the end of the age of Pisces now rises Aquarius, and now now rises the goddess essentially. Just like in the Bible, it talks about how Mary Magdalene is to carry on the teachings, and I think that's really important because it correlates with the astronomy, and it correlates obviously with the story of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, and biblical history. But I just find that really intriguing the parallels that you can see there: the, mm -hmm. the end of the Piscean era and the beginning of the Aquarian era, and it's parallel to the Bible and the story of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene. Oh, of course. And it's bringing in the, the, the feminine side of everything. You know, I mean, Scott, I learned from you that what was it Ramses and, um, you know, was trying to unite the two uh, ages with the ram and, and, the, mm -hmm. and, and the hook. Oh, with the, uh, with the, Taurus the bull and Aries the ram. Akana, Akhenaten. Right. Cross crook and the flail on his chest, those two symbols, because that was a transition between that, the age from one to the other. And I, I, you know, that is a really good example. It's a really uh, visual example that people can can understand. And then, of course, you know, uh, and, and the other thing about this goes back to the whole procession mm -hmm. of the equinoxes, right? And I right. think a lot of people just do the math and say, okay, 26,000 divided by 12 is 2,160, whatever. Well, no, it's not a, an equal uh, division. The earth has that wobble to it, right? Uh, size of the constellation, right? Oh, and that as well. Yeah. That has its own impact. You know, the Taurus lasted a long time. Taurus is a big constellation. Aries was very small. small right. You get, in, you get into Pisces and it's sort of an average size. And next thing you know, we're getting to the end of the great year. The, the, to, to me, one of the most amazing revelations that I had when I was studying procession of the equinoxes is that at the end of this processional cycle, 
the end of this 26,000 year long cycle is what we're living through right now. Right. I mean, think about that. It's Talk about the end times, right? <laughs> well, it's well, end times, end time, but, but then yeah. new beginning times, right? right? Right. But it's one of the most profound moments in human history. And um, if you believe in prophecy, and I'm not saying it's something I believe or don't believe in, but if you study something and you see enough of this data that supports, you know, uh, an idea, prophecy is something that becomes very interesting. And one of the things that prophecy says is this time that we're going through right now is supposed to be a time of great upheaval, right. of great difficulty, of great challenges. And boy, that shit true. <laughs> Look around. <laughs> Not only do you get a cave full of sheep shit, you have a, pa- a global <laughs> pandemic. You have. Why'd you tell him about that? <laughs> We're never going to hear the end of it. Now. I know there's photos of that. I got to see it. I got to see like this layer. <laughs> I'll get you. We'll get you a yeah, photo. Yeah, I'll send some over. Don't worry. <laughs> only if only photos could smell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank, thank God they can't. Yeah, right. Oh my God. Yeah. No, Scott. I mean, a lot of this you just got to have fun with it though, because I mean, a lot of it's real serious, and a lot of it hits you really up. Yeah. And a lot of yeah. people it goes over the head, and they put their hair, they bury their head in the sand because they can't deal yeah. with it, and they don't or want the sheep to. Shit. Or, or in the, the sheep, sheep shit. shit. Yeah. <laughs> head first into the sheep shit. I'm over it. <laughs> but no, no it's true. You, you're, you're right. You have to keep your. Uh, sense of humor about all this stuff because frankly some of the stuff right now is so so uh it's 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 difficult i mean it's hard i mean you just lost a friend i've yeah. lost a couple of friends to covid and um you know you've got you know you you, you we've got challenges just with people even accepting that it's a thing you know <laughs> the, what's the, the best way to handle it and yeah. you know what and and it's hard to argue sometimes with people that have a different viewpoint than you because it's not like this is established law or this is has a historical precedent, right? Right. This totally. It's brand new. And it's like, we're kind of making it up as we go along in a lot of ways. And, and it's just, it's like this whole prophecy thing of upheaval right now. And then you throw that in on top of it. It's like, good God. The volcanoes <laughs> are going off. They got the prophecy thing going on. We got earthquakes the, everywhere. The, Vikings, Minnesota Vikings are losing to the Detroit Lions. Really? <laughs> we know something's wrong now. <laughs> Something is very, very, very wrong. I'm a Minnesota Vikings season ticket holder. Yesterday was just not a good day. <laughs> it's just I, I haven't seen the Detroit Lions win ever, so I don't know. <laughs> well, that was the first win of the year. So there <laughs> well, there, well, there you go. It's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Uh, wow. Anyway. No, it, no, I think it's, I, man, I'm so excited that you, you're hooking this tour up and you guys are doing this. This is going to be so amazing. June, right? I mean, that's the first time right. this yeah. is going to kick yeah. off. What are the dates now? What are the dates? Yes. So the dates are June 5th to the 13th. And we'll actually be, I think this evening, releasing a post that has the dates and prices. Nice. It's going to be an eight-day tour with an additional um, day and night. If bonus people, day. A bonus day. Bono. People want to go, and it's just going to be an extra day in Edinburgh to kind of see the sights, be a regular tourist, um, instead of just being a Templar researcher. <laughs> go pick but out some knickknacks really for the kids in Edinburgh. Yes, bring, yes. Bring back some sheep shit. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> part of the bonus day. Oh, that's the bonus day. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so not that, free. That's no, it's never free, but. <laughs> The tour will be taking people to sites that they would never normally see or know about just by going on regular tours with tour guides here in Scotland. This is mm-hmm. going to be a very unique experience, but also because we have contacts, places that we'll be able to get our guests into that regular tour guides wouldn't be able to get their guests into. So, and these will be archaeological sites, sites like caves with carvings that Templars may have hidden out, hid, head out in during. Well, we, we, well, let's put it this way. The Weems Caves are a site that we're going to be taking people to. And they are mentioned in these documents that Uh, in researching never before anywhere has anybody mentioned this information. Now, what we will tell you is that in these caves, modern archeologists say they have concluded that in the 14th century, Mm -hmm. that there were Christian monks lived in these caves. Hmm. Now, last I checked, the Templars were Christian monks, weren't they? Yeah, I think so. Like, at least they pretended to be at any point and that they needed to be. <laughs> so, so that is something that we were unaware of. And the carvings inside this cave are unbelievable. I mean, Uh-oh. they are just incredible. 
And we actually see some carvings that are inside this cave that are identical to caves uh, carvings that we've seen over in North America. Awesome. Do you find any hooked X's, Scott? Any hooked X's hidden in there? You know what? We got to save something for the tour. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, I had to ask. I had to ask. I had to ask. No, but I mean, seriously, this is this is new information. This is this is stuff that the world doesn't even know about yet. And in fact, one of the things that we would like to do before we get done here is share with you a fun fact Ooh. from the journals that um, nobody knows. So. I I'm, I'm familiar with you and I've talked off the record and I'm familiar with where these journals kind of came from and, and their provenance and they've been uh, separately uh, authenticated, so to speak, um, corroborating, we been, right? Uh, we have worked with Masonic scholars. We've worked with academics. We have done uh, genealogists, everything that we have done so far. We have plenty of yellow flags on the floor, which are questions, right. but red flags. Everything has vetted out. To our satisfaction, I've accepted these things as genuine, and um, you know. But you know, for me to say it is one thing, but for the world to accept it is another. But you know, let's face it; it's going to be an uphill battle. I mean, my God, mm -hmm. the Kensington Runestone—we're still talking about twenty years now, right? <laughs> it's been twenty years. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's been twenty years. Yeah. You know, funny thing. I just got to tell you, um, and I, I, I've said this before when people talk about the Kensington Runestone. I say, look. Go on the website, uh, go on to Wikipedia. You know, I've done probably more work than anyone. You won't see my name anywhere on there. Mm -mm. And I hit me on Twitter and he goes, you know what? He goes, I heard you say that on the radio. And he goes, I didn't believe you. So he goes, I went on the site and I made a couple of additions. Nice. He said, my stuff was taken down in less than five minutes. Wow. And now what he does is he's going on there repeatedly to see how long they, and they keep taking him down. They actually banned him for a while. Wow. Back. But anyway, it just goes to show you that it's, I don't know when this is ever going to be accepted because they just don't, they don't want the truth. Well, let me see where we're going with this, uh, with a little bit of background <laughs> information. Uh, the Battle of Bannockburn was fought <laughs> in 1314. And it was led by Robert the Bruce, obviously one of the battles, many battles between the English and the Scots. And Robert the Bruce had led this army and they were losing. And from written record, there was a secret weapon that Robert the Bruce had. And at the end of this battle, when the Scots were actually losing and the English thought they had them, one of the Englishmen actually wrote this account saying that Robert the Bruce's secret weapon came galloping over the hill on horseback. And I believe it said something about them wearing white tunics with red crosses. And they were the ones that helped them win Bannockburn and therefore Scotland's independence in 1314. And that being said, we're going right into this really interesting right. journal entry. So that is a longstanding legend that most academics have written off as fantasy, right? Right, right. Now, I just I, wa I want to preface what I'm about to read to you is that there are 20 books of these journals and we've only published one, the first, mm -hmm. which is quite extensive. But what we're going to read from you now is the one of the unpublished parts of one of the unpublished journals. Oh, nice. and so um, we do know that this, this connection to the Templars at Bannockburn mm -hmm. does have a little bit of truth uh, from the journals aside, because we know that Henry St. Clair and his two sons, John and William from yeah. Roslyn, actually did fight at Bannockburn uh, beside Robert the Bruce. Well, there you go. This would be Earl Henry, uh, Earl Henry's grandfather. Right, right. And his father, uh, William, and his, and his grandfather, and his would be his uncle John. Yeah, right. Yeah. Wow. At Bannockburn. So there is some historical, accepted historical information that seems to, to fit here. But I'm going to read uh, part of a journal entry from May 1st, 1395. And this is Earl Henry Sinclair writing. And at that time, I think we figured out he was, what, 34 years old? Yes. No, no, no. he would have been, let's see, he was born in 45, so he's 50. He's 50 years old. He was 35 when he built Kirkwall Castle. Yes, that's right. In 79. This is 1395. Okay. Um, our goal is to find a better route to the empires of China further south than the ice-covered lakes. Now, that makes you pause right there. The ice-covered lakes. 
He's talking about the Great Lakes. Now, how would he know that those lakes were ice covered already in 1395? How would he know that? Because somebody had obviously been there. Before. Yeah, right. I mean, but that's a pretty telling thing. And that's, that's you know, the Great Lakes. Wow. Anyway, um, further south in the ice covered lakes and suitable land for settlement beyond the boundaries of Groenland. And that's the old spelling of Greenland. Got it. Okay. Which we visit on our journey. We also travel with 120 remaining Knights Templars, descendants of those at Bannockburn under my grandfather's rule in search of a free Templar state. Wow. 13. I'll let that sink in. Wow. So what he's telling us is that, yes, the Templars did serve at Bannockburn, just like the legend that you quoted. And what happened was because of their service, the earls of, of, uh, of Scotland were obligated to protect those Templars. And they hid them out in various places like the Weems Caves for generations, for at least two generations. Wow. It says the descendants of Bannockburn. So... And, and what it also tells us is that those descendants were done with Europe. Right. They were done with the church. They were done with this BS, right? Mm-hmm. They were ready to go to North America to take their chances. And one of the things that we talk about is how the indigenous people of North America shared a similar ideology. And all I can tell you is those native women over there, they weren't bad looking either. <laughs> You know, and and in all seriousness, they intermarried with them. Right. And they uh, they didn't turn the natives into Templars. No, no. There was already a tradition in Native uh, North America that yes. is very yes. similar to from the masonry for the three degrees of masonry. I it's think you and I have talked. It's the same thing. About, yeah. It's called the Medewin, and I've been in their lodges. You told me you were there, right? You hung out with them. They're the sweat lodges, yeah. right? Is that the yeah. sweat lodges? Yeah. And yeah. it's the same tradition almost, right? Or is it exactly? It's the same tradition. I mean, there's differences. Um, one of the, you know, one of the things that the secrets that they pass on are um, probably the most uh, uh, important, at least in my mind, is the use of medicinal plants, right? Oh. So what is, you know, good and what's what to stay away from. But anyway, um, yeah, 120 nights brought over and they were not coming back. They stayed. Wow. And there's history of that. That that just that just goes right into the history of the Kensington Runestone and then on and on and on and on. And Absolutely. On, right? Absolutely. Well, King Robert the Bruce, um, King Robert was so grateful for the help that the Templars had brought him at Bannockburn that he actually granted lands like I think it was Pentland. And then there is a, a couple other estates that were granted to Henry St. Clair because he was so grateful for the Templars involvement. I'm assuming that's why they were granted, but for his right. involvement and Henry St. Clair, the grandfather mentioned in that journal entry, was the one that was responsible, most likely, for bringing those Templars to Robert the Bruce's aid at Bannockburn. Right, right. That's amazing. That's such a great I mean, this connection. Is, this, this is new history. I mean, this I, I've never publicly said anything about that journal entry before, but even in just those few couple sentences, there's a lot to unpack. And the last part, to establish a free Templar state. <laughs> I think I'm sitting in it. What's he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm sitting in in that in that state. I think you're sitting in it. Exactly. Yeah, I think I, I think I'm sitting in it. Thank you, Brother Sinclair, <laughs> from those years there ago. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> and, I mean, that's, that's uh, yeah. It's pretty profound. It's amazing, and then that's why everybody's like, "Well, why were all the signers of the Declaration of Independence Masons?" And like, well, duh. well you know and 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 actually john i mean on a serious note especially today and i don't want to go too far down the the negative well but yeah yeah think of what happened on january 6th and these people that think that they understand the constitution they think (laughs) they understand the tenets upon which this nation was founded I think it's important for people to understand. I'm just going to say it, okay? Yeah. Our country was founded by Freemasonry. Yeah. Period. Mm-hmm. End of discussion, okay? And 
53 of the 56 signers of the declaration were master masons. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, if that isn't the evidence that proves what I just said. <laughs> yeah, prove me wrong. <laughs> prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Those other so, guys, the other guys messed up and they just got their petitions lost in the mail. And they, yeah, they, they, they got lost they in the got, mail. Those three guys, what the hell was wrong with them? Yeah, they, they're like, we need three no. people that, that aren't Masons. Can we get, go, <laughs> go get Bill and whoever else we need to bring? <laughs> they couldn't do their obligations. I don't know. Yeah, every, it's like, can we come system. up with the money for the thing? I don't know. Dues don't payments. Know. But, but I, that's an important point, don't you think? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And it's, and I always point this out to people who are like, well, you know, everybody has that conspiracy theory. It's, oh, it's a cabal or going to control us. I'm like, well, think about this. Like a lot of the things that masonry is built upon is tolerance for any type of religion and, and thinking and education and tolerance for all. Right. I mean, right. where else that, that didn't exist anywhere else on the planet. Right. It was, there was a rule. There was a totalitarian rule. I mean, there was some forms of some type of parliamentary things, but no, in a Masonic lodge and, and now here in America, everybody has a vote, right? Everybody has a vote and it counts, right? That right. didn't exist anywhere else. They brought those ideals from masonry and made it what our country is and what it is now. So a lot of people right. get really confused by that. They're like, ah, you know, this is what it's like. No, we took the ideals that we live on and we still do as Masons, you know, tolerance, um, compassion, uh, brotherhood, you know, relief, truth, all of those things. Right. And, and, charity. And charity of huge, the big one, you know, and, and we, yeah. we established a, a, a new world, uh, right? A new society built upon those principles. And that's what we're enjoying and living with today. People just get lost on that. And yeah, I guess if they don't like it, they can go to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Canada is a pretty good place too. My mother was born and raised there, so I'm half Canadian. So don't you pick on my people. It's okay. I'm the, no offense. I'm just saying it's cold. They can go do what they want. No, no. Yeah, I, I, I get you. Brother. It's it's America Light. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it's like you know Budweiser, Bud Light. It's, it's America Light. That's all. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> so I. But yeah. no, I mean, it's it's amazing, you know. And uh, Haley and I, we've talked about uh, all kinds of stuff, you know, and Scott, you and I have talked about all kinds of stuff. And I love the fact that, uh, you know, we've got to talk about uh, UFOs at some point, right? Because I know, yeah, you know, that that always comes into play and all of this, right? Bring, and bring it, bring it. I, so like when I, after I became a Mason, you know, I was always on the quest for my whole entire life. And, you know, I look, you know, UFOs, I know there's something out there, whatever else. But after I became a Mason, I was like, oh, oh wow. I'll, I'll, like you've, I've heard you say lots of times, Scott, like, Things that are hidden in plain sight, you all of a sudden start seeing them, right? The symbology of things after you become a Mason, you get to pick up on right away and you, you see things that are always there and you understand the reasoning behind them and it does something to you. So when after I became a Master Mason, I was like, oh my, there is you know, everything that's it's here. I feel like that's part of that whole phenomenon as well. There's something of, involved with Masonry that it definitely has a connection to any of this off-world intelligence or, or, or whatever you want to call it, right? And if not, the people that are Masons have definitely had to have their hands in the, you know, in the hiding of the knowledge or, or the use of the knowledge or any of this stuff, or even maybe part of the communication with whatever these uh, off-world intelligences are. And that was kind of my quest to start this whole thing. That's why I wanted to come out in public and be like, look, I need to find other Masons that kind of feel the same way I do or other people anyway. Right. I mean, right. I thought for sure if I could find other brothers that kind of felt the same way and shake them and go, Hey, what do you think? Don't, don't think I'm crazy, but you have to listen to me now. So, <laughs> and some people go running away and other people are really into it. You know, uh, some of my brothers are like, Oh, cool. John's here. I got to go. But, um, other ones are, you know, they come up and they're just really into it. So in all of you, you know, Haley and I, know, you know, Scott, we've talked about, but is there anything that through all of the research and all the things you're finding in our, all the artifacts and historical sites, is there anything that's connecting the dots from ufology, the phenomenon, any of that with masonry or, or, or the ancients? Yes. Yeah. The, the answer is yes. Um, and I knew it. I, <laughs> yeah, no, the answer is a big yes, because yes. Um, in the last uh, year and a half, some of the documents that have come forward actually were there several years ago, but we just, we were so wrapped up in one other part. We sort of left that and it's kind of weird. It was like sitting there the whole time. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like everything has its time when you want to, when you focus on it and it was time for that uh, to focus on that particular document. And it was called um, the book of the wars of the Lord. And if you look that up on Wikipedia right now, it will tell you that there is no known extant copy 
known to exist. There isn't anything that exists anymore. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, but um, we don't know of any copies that that exist. So there's nothing known about it. Wow. Ex- a copy that exists now. <laughs> Wait a minute, you cut out there. You cut out the most important part, <laughs> froze. Did I? <laughs> yes. I think I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all um, I heard was, exist now. It, it, there is a copy, of, uh, at least part of, there's a copy of at least part of the book of the wars of the Lord. And without going into the details of it, there is something very interesting that is mentioned in one of the passages. And it's certainly biblical, and it says something to the effect of, and then a silver beast descended from the cloud uh, with, uh, with wings like a bird that sent out lightning bolts that struck the water that caused the men to, the enemy to get palsy, fall into the water, dead. The horses were electrocuted and so on and so forth. Wow. So what the hell is this silver beast that descends from, descends from the clouds? With wings and electrocutes everything? And electrocutes everything. Um, I personally think that that, I, I can't think of anything else other than <laughs> possibly an uh, unidentified aerial craft. That's well, amazing. Another, another, area of, of interest for me back when I was in college, I had given actually a presentation in my speech class and I got all these bizarre looks. Cause I gave a lecture over, um, the cargo cults and the, Pacific Oh yeah. Islands. Oh yeah. So during the war, obviously these people that were living on these islands were worshiping the cargo planes that were flying overhead and dropping off things. And the reason being is because they believed <clears throat> because they didn't understand it. They believed it to be divine. Right. And why couldn't this have been something that was around thousands of years ago. This was just a recent example. This could right. have been right. for thousands of years. And this passage from the book of the wars of the Lord confirms that because people that cannot explain technology when they don't understand it, it's divine. It's God. It's, it's something greater than themselves. And that's what religion is founded upon. Yeah. Which is amazing. Wow. That's so awesome, Scott. I, I yeah. mean, Haley, Haley, that's, that's great. I mean, cause that's it. Proof. Well, that's, that's, well, in this case, it wasn't even that people were venerating this thing. It's just like it showed up and it just took out a bunch of a bunch of warriors, you know, at this time for one side versus the other. But I, I, forget about what the cause was. Forget about who was fighting who. What the hell was that thing? Right. 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 I, I, the only thing I can conclude is it might be the possibly the earliest represent, you know, uh, representation of, of an alien spacecraft. And it's in a biblical document that funny no longer exists. Now the, the other part of this that we haven't told you is that there is a very uh, obvious reference to the sacred feminine uh-huh. as she is called as the consort of the Lord equal status. And she is the one who called on the silver beast. So I'm not really sure how to interpret that. But what I can tell you is, is that that's the reason why this document disappeared, is that putting a feminine, right? The, the lead. Them on an equal plane with the Lord, that's, the church isn't going to put up with that. So I think the reason that we don't know about it anymore is they made sure that it disappeared. But guess who had a copy of it? The Templars. Uh, imagine that. Uh, funny. Imagine funny. That. Isn't it funny how that works? Funny. But isn't that interesting? It's very interesting. We're dropping some bombs on you here that we haven't told anybody yet. Well, I appreciate it. I love you guys. That's amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, this uh, is this is like groundbreaking stuff. I mean, this is this is the stuff. I'm I'm afraid for you guys now, honestly. <laughs> I'm like, we're looking behind my shoulder. Too. I'm looking. I'm We're wait. so out of control. It's I'm, not even funny. I'm but. waiting. I'm waiting for the. Te- I'm waiting for the Vatican van along with the black van to come up and uh, snag me out of here at any moment. I was, I was worried about the government. Now I got to worry what? about the Pope. <laughs> it's recorded. You've got it. Get it out there. And once it's out there, what are they going to do? It's too That's, late. 
That's right. That's why I went. That's why I went public finally. Because before, when you know, when I was younger, I was afraid. Of, you know, people just disappeared, and now I'm like, man, you can live stream all this on Facebook, and what exactly, are they gonna, man. What are they, they're not going to you know come what? get my tape. <laughs> it's like, good luck, man. Look, if they were going to take me out, they would have taken me out a long time ago. Believe me, I've been a heretic for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of some major uh, bombshell. Uh, bombshells we're going to be doing lectures on this tour as well on the first oh, yeah. night we're going to be on and on the last night there will be a lecture as well so obviously on the tour all of our guests will be attending the lecture and then it'll also be open to the public here in edinburgh in scotland nice that's going to be awesome yeah. That is gonna be, this is going to be like an epic, epic time. I mean, totally. I think everybody should just jump on it right now, get tickets. I'm trying to pry my yeah. wife and, you know, I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. She let's always, go. she wants to go. She wants to go hang out so bad. And, and you know, the other, the other, the other thing that I want to just say about this tour is Haley has spent time investigating the, um, uh, the wine bars, the <laughs> <laughs> distilleries and, um, it's I research. Mean, it's research. To relax too. I mean, after all the mind blowing stuff that they're going to see and they're learn about, a, <laughs> they're going to need a drink for sure. They're going to be there, but it just came out. No, 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 no. That's fine. Yeah, they're going to need a drink for sure. Yeah, everybody's going to be like, "Where's the nearest pub?" <laughs> we're better to have a you know a glass of scotch in Scotland. Come on, right. man. God's sakes. That's the place. That's, that's probably that's why it was, that's, that's the bonus. Day. That's why it was created right there. There's so much shit going on. It was like, we need something to deal with this. <laughs> I know your mind's going to be blown. So you got to settle down somehow. Oh my God. That's amazing. And I know it's not part of this tour, but my wife has always hopped up on the, um, uh, um, outlander. Um, well, we'll do, I'm looking at putting oh together. A tour for the, for the <laughs> talking about that. She'll never, she'll go forever and i just met those guys i just met, met the two them. actors i know she saw the post on facebook because i shared it and she lost yeah. her mind she just walked into my office she's like what she's like hey your friend Haley is just hanging out with the guys from outlander i'm like i don't know that's just amazing like so yes, pumped yes. for you so I, I know i've been working on potentially doing tours with them for them uh that are the official types of outlander tours and that sort of thing so that's still yeah. a work in progress but that's when i met them and i presented them with these gift boxes i put together from a local area of scotland it was wonderful really nice guys awesome uh, first thing the first thing sam did and your wife will appreciate this but sam who plays jamie fraser when he opened the box he saw that there was a little bottle of whiskey from a distillery called called glengarry distillery the yeah. first thing he did it's nine in the morning as he opens it and sniffs it and he goes oh, this smells so good <laughs> This, but he's a whiskey, a whiskey fanatic. And the next thing he does is pick up the champagne cider. There's a local champagne cider maker in Aberdeenshire. And he picks up the, the bottle of the champagne cider and he looks around and he goes, shall we have a toast? And Greg McTavish, who plays Dougal McKenzie, his uncle says, Sam, it's nine in the morning. Do you ever stop drinking? <laughs> and to see these guys in person. And um, yeah, I, we're, I'm looking at putting together an Outlander tour, likely for the week after our tour. Oh, that's amazing. I just have to hang out a little bit longer. I was going to be like a month tour. I think we're just going to hang out for like three weeks. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> got to find our own cheap shit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, believe me, there's plenty here. You won't have any problem. <laughs> nice sweater, full, <laughs> just nice wool sweater. I think I'll be good and yeah. full of sheep shit. That's awesome. No, I, I'm so excited for you, Haley. Then Scott, this is this is going to be an amazing tour. I mean, just getting everybody, you know, educated on this is going to be massive, and I, I can't wait. Especially with all the research. And so, Scott, like, when's this coming out? I know you've been writing a book on all of this oh, stuff. Oh God, you know, just like I, you and Haley, I, you guys are like the king, the, the queen, king and queen of writing amazing books that are about this close <laughs> to being done. Well, you know what? We've been uh, we've been talking to networks about this. We've been talking to some other parties that are interested in this, and we are right on the precipice. I mean. We have a production company ready to go. We have a showrunner ready to go. Um, I, I think, I, well, part of the problem is the holidays now. Oh, yeah, but right. I know that uh, as soon as we get through the holidays, it's going to be, it's, it'll be, either way, we're going to be go time on this. And, you know, part of the, part of what we need is to have people behind us to, you know, to help fund us. I mean, it's oh, yeah. money to go to these places, to, to look for treasure sites, to go to, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, some of the places are, are just way the hell out there. Right. But uh, the other problem we've had is we haven't been able to get up into Canada until the last month. Right. And that's where a lot of our sites are. So we just, we couldn't go even, even if we were ready. 
Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, COVID screwed up everything totally. I mean, yeah. I get it. But I mean, one of the things, and we were joking about it a little bit ago, but one of the things, you know, I know the Vatican buys a lot of documents, you know, and, and I'm, and I've heard some stories about some of the documents, you know, like being acquired. Some even, yeah. you, you even have copies of some of the, the, the documents that the Vatican's actually oh, purchased. Absolutely. You know, it, it turns out, it turns out, um, in, in, in the, the one side of the documents that we have, the Cremona document material, right. I that bought this document back in 1971 and did the re all the research he could for 23 years. Mm. And, and when he realized that his health was failing and he wasn't going to live much longer, he decided to sell the document to the Vatican. Right. And it's interesting because the guy that he sold the document to was a guy by the name of Archbishop Paul Marcinkus. Now that name won't mean anything to you, but yeah, you saw the Da Vinci code, right? Yeah, was he the, the crazy assassin guy? Like, Remember the guy that self-flagellated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Silas, the albino Silas. monk? Yeah. That character was patterned after Marcinkus. That reminds me also of, um, I think it was Bishop Ar Aringarosa also as well. And he is like the, the, the teacher or the one that tells Silas to go on this mission. Oh, is it what? Was him? Yeah, that was him. In the movie, you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Of course. So this, 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 this guy that bought the document, we presume for the Vatican, maybe he bought it for himself, but he is also the guy, Paul Marcinkus, that is believed to be the one who killed Pope John Paul I, 1978, because he was the only one that had a key to the secret entrance to the Pope's bedroom. Oh, wow. And it was killed on the, the 33rd day of, of his being Pope. And they tried to blame it on, hold it. A Freemason. The Freemasons. Oh, yeah. But as it turns out, he sold this document. But what we have now figured out is he had more than just copies. He had copies and then added material on top of it that the Vatican never got. Well, nice. well speaking of the Vatican... This reminds me of, I think it was Brother Dave had told you something about yep. the material that the Vatican had. Oh, yeah. Well, it's in my, I know who you're talking about. She's using the term Brother Dave. He's a Freemason. He, uh, I do know his last name, but I don't use it because he's retired ex-military, CIA, all this stuff. And he just prefers to stay anonymous. And that's yeah, fine. That's great. Yeah. And because of that, he shares a lot of interesting information. And one of the things that he shared with me a number of years ago was a letter that he wrote to a brother who was working at the Vatican archives at the time. And um, he wrote to him about the marriage document that is talked about in the Cremona document. But I got this material from Brother Dave before I ever knew about this stuff in the um, uh, about the um, marriage document in the Cremona document. But he wrote to this archbishop and he wrote back and he said, yes, it is true. This document is in our archives. Whoa. And the guy wrote, and I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what he said, but he goes, yes, it is true that our Lord, this document uh, says that our Lord married uh, Mary Magdalene. He says, I cannot speak for the veracity of the document, but I can tell you that it will never see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But so the Vatican sitting on the marriage document of Mary Magdalene and our Lord. Our Lord. He used the term our Lord. Right, right, right. But we know who but that we is. We know who he's talking about. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that will never come out. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. At least not not willingly. Although, you know, something very interesting now that we're segueing off on documents that will never come out of the Vatican. Yeah. One of the things I heard from a, a, a brother, a very enlightened brother, is that Napoleon, during his campaign, one of the things that he allegedly did was he raided the Vatican archives. Did you know that? No, that's very interesting. I've been hearing a lot of symbology with N Napoleon being a Freemason, and there's a lot of he debate. was a Freemason. Oh there's yeah, he of, was for sure. Yeah, he the was symbology. a troubled brother. A, <laughs> somebody, somebody needed to whisper in his ear more than probably God. But yeah, the legend is is that um, he raided the Vatican archives looking specifically for documents that were related to the Templars, and he got them. Ah. Uh -huh. 
copied them, and then he returned them. Really? Oh, that's so nice of him. Yeah. <laughs> Just like checking out of the library. You got to return your book when you're done. Yeah. So the big question is, where is his stuff, right? Right. Wow. That's amazing. That's, I, didn't know I, I had no idea he rated it. That's. Yeah. That's one of the things that we would also like to do when we get going. So. Stay tuned for that. You're not going to rate it. You're just going to go ask and see if you can see him, right? <laughs> I got to rate it, brother. I'm going to rate it. I don't care. I want the shit. <laughs> they got 53 miles of shelving down there. 53 miles of documentation. Do you know that? Mm. That's amazing. Wow. 53 yeah. miles. What are they sitting on? Everything. Literally everything. 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 And you know what else they probably have in there? The book of the wars of the Lord. Probably every copy that ever existed. Yep. They're all right there in every so language. They know about so what does that tell you? They know all about this uh, UAP phenomena, don't they? Yeah. I mean, uh, D Diane, Dr. Diana Pasolka did her book, you know, American Cosmic, and where she went to the Vatican and she, you know, she got documentation and, you know, the, one of the translations, I think, I don't know if it was part of the book or if it was just people I know or hearsay after the fact or whatever, but it seemed to be that the translation for cloud in the Bible was purposefully translated to cloud and it's supposed to mean light in the sky or ball of light or craft of light or came down on a craft or you know like a right, a, right. something like or that. a silver beast with wings that <laughs> lightning bolts right well i remember being at one of eric von daniken's lectures and he had delivered this just amazing <clears throat> lecture and then he released this photo it was actually i think a 3d image of what had been put together to resemble the wheel of ezekiel mm -hmm. and it just insane when they revealed it on screen in this, you know, in front, in, the, in front of the audience on this massive screen, you have this fiery chariot, right? That descends from the heavens, yeah. this fiery chariot, the wheel of Ezekiel. It just, it was stunning mm -hmm. based on the, the details that are given in the passage. I mean, once it was put together, it was no doubt some kind of vessel that was made to fly from the heavens to the earth. It's amazing. It, and just talk about the biblical um, description of angels will scare the shit out of everybody. It's just a bunch of yeah. people. Have you seen the people have actually made these things that are just wheels with eyes, like a billion eyes and like feathers. Oh. And it's like the, it's, it's, I'll put a picture up, but it's like Google, like a, an actual representation of the biblical angels. It'll scare the hell out of you. That's why I like, I don't know if I want to, John. no, it is. It's just, it's like a big ball of eyes and wings and fire. Ugh. And it's, that's why when in the Bible, every time it's like, don't be afraid. And it's like, well, you don't, you picture like this flowing, you know, creature coming out. So it's this big ball of eyes and fire and stuff. coming. Like, okay. So, so this, this picture I took, in a church in uh, Covington, Kentucky, which is on the south side of the river. It's the sister city to Cincinnati, Ohio. Right across the border. Yeah, I'm familiar. You know where it is. Yep, okay. Yep. And there is a uh, basilica there that is a replication of Notre Dame. Oh. I mean, it is like a, a, a one half or one third uh, replica of it, but it's beautiful. Wow. This car, this um, painting is in there, and I don't want to go into too much, but just a couple things. One is, you see the dude in the red cloak behind Jesus? Yeah, he's got Ooh. a he's got a squ uh, square above his head or compass above yeah. his head. Yeah, he totally does. So who who is that? Is that God? It's a great architect of the universe. A great architect. Of the universe. <laughs> but then, what I want you to do, you see that square above his head? Yes. Triangle, actually. It's white, yeah. Wait, let's see. Is it white? Yeah. Here, let me blow it up. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, let's go above him. Take that triangle and flip it and put it around that dove. You got a triangle with the point down, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Feminine? Masculine. And the masculine. And who's above? She is, right? Yeah, always. And you see the God rays in this image are emanating from her? Yeah. Okay. Now, the next part is, this is the fun part. Who are all those angels? Wow. With wings. That's amazing. They go all the way over to each side. side. It's it's hard to see, but yeah, I can see them. Definitely. Side. Who are these angels? I don't know. 
that are in the, they're always in the heavens, right? Right, right, right. Oh, well, the other With good wings. part of that photo actually is who you see, I don't know if it's going to come through, weeping at the bottom of the cross. There is the consort. Oh, yeah. With orange, wearing orange and green, yes. And the other thing that's hard to see, but right next to her are three skulls. Do you see the three skulls? I, I do. And if you look in the distance, you see the wall of the walled city to the west. Oh, yeah. That means those skulls are in the south, west, and east quadrants. <laughs> Does ring a bell? It's so Masonic. That, that, the whole thing is, is very, very Masonic. Uh, very much so. Mm -hmm. My point was these angels that are, you know, who are they? They're all just hovering above. Yeah. Is that an alien reference? The Watchers? The Watchers, yeah. The thing that I always found yeah. interesting is I always kind of imagined that potentially – the reference to angels, these, these beings that flew to and from the heavens, maybe they didn't actually have wings. Maybe these wings were applied to them because these people were just trying to make it known that they were capable of flight. Flight. Yeah. Anthropomorph. Uh, anthropomorph I can't. Speak. Anthropomorphic. That's it. <laughs> anthropomorphizing. They're anthropomorphizing them into something yeah, they yes. could understand. <laughs> I did right. take English class. I swear. I, I, yeah. But you know, that's, that's a big word. <laughs> we got lots of big words we all struggle with. We <laughs> okay, I can't English some days either, John. <laughs> Anthropomorphizing. I'm, I swear it's a word. And that's yeah. not even a word, I don't think. <laughs> it is now. It is it now. now. It's in our vernacular. It so is now. Go. Yeah, they were trying to, to, descri to ascribe um, either animal or human traits into something they couldn't explain. Right, right. They could, they, things fly, put always, wings on them. Exactly. And it always made perfect sense to me from the ancient astronaut theory perspective. You know, if you were going to attribute something uh, like that to a being of flight, you would put wings on it, you know, or you would have a, a fiery chariot or a flying silver beast. With wings. With wings Descending yes. from the heavens. Exactly. I, I just can't get that out of my head. I, 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 it has to, I, I don't know what else you can conclude other than it's something to do with extraterrestrials. That's the only thing I can conclude. It has um, to. I think too. I, I wrote a paper a while back on um, the. Oh, now now I'm going to lose it on the. It's the it's the theory that has been proven true. Panspermia. Yes, I think. Ah, panspermia. Panspermia. Yeah, we, we did. We talked about that before. But panspermia. Panspermia. Yeah, <laughs> That's not a movie. Word. I can't That's not a movie. Just late at night. <laughs> I know, but you know, I, I wrote a paper on this because I was so taken by it because it talks about proof that life, in essence, is extraterrestrial in origin that life was not native to earth i mean water was not native to earth either it also came from outer space to earth but that's a whole other thing i've heard that it's true i I've learned heard it in that my thesis, astronomy yeah. class yeah and so um panspermia theory has been since proven true that life came to earth by way of bacterial spore therefore all life is extraterrestrial in origin and if these bacterial spores were floating around earth where else in the universe were they floating around that led to evolution to different beings I mean, it's just incredible to think about. Everywhere. I just remember like not even 10 years ago, it's like, well, we find water, we're going to find life. And there's no water anywhere. And there's like, well, there's water on the moon. There's water on Mars. There's water on Mercury, which is the closest planet to the yeah. sun. There's water. Yeah, in, how it, can it exist in a vapor state or It's what? frozen in the, in the uh, uh, always dark craters that are in mer Mercury. There's like craters that have ice that's perpetually frozen because mm -hmm. they're perpetually dark. But there's, I have not heard that. Really? Yeah, I've look at that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but yeah. before, I remember my whole life, it's like as soon as we find water somewhere, we got life. And now it's like it every planet there's ocean planets there's frozen ocean like yeah. titans the moons you know of jupiter and saturn are all you know enceladus and all these other planets ganymede everything is just an ocean it's like wow there was also uh, a vessel and I, I don't know if it was i can't remember which one it was but i do remember seeing something about this and i was just flabbergasted when i saw it i thought oh my god this is it this is proof but nobody talked about it and it was the fact that one of these vessels came back from outer space and had phytoplankton oh uh, yeah and it was the same phytoplankton that we find in the ocean. And I thought, oh my God, this is, it's identical. This is, this is big. This is huge. I mean, this is proving that life came from outer space and nobody was really talking about it. 
Well, I thought they I thought they were they said that well that could have been contaminated by earth no, before it left. That, did, they, did they pull that no. story? No, they didn't do that one. No. I haven't no. heard that. Well, they found a way to poo poo it. They, they tried, said. they tried, but Yeah. Yeah. No, I I never, the, we've been there, done that. Yeah. Good God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you know. know. It, it's like it's like now they're you know, the the latest, you probably saw that story about how the Vinland map is uh, absolutely a forgery now because they found remnants of uh titanium in it and uh, i think it was titanium I'm, i think it was titanium and titanium wasn't discovered until 1795 or some ridiculous thing and i'm like oh, just because you didn't discover it <laughs> doesn't mean it's not there <laughs> it was until then it probably existed before that okay yeah. and maybe the people that that made the vinland map if it is indeed genuine which i think it probably is uh, maybe they just found that this particular material worked really good as ink and that's why they used it. Yeah. And I, you know, and then I, I read the, a little more about it and they said, well, it, it's at a certain concentration and it's only at this concentration in modern times. What? What do you mean? Couldn't have been at that concentration before. It, just, it, it doesn't prove anything. And so when you look at these arguments, you have to look very hard, but they fall apart pretty fast. And it seems to me that these academics, especially in the humanities disciplines, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The hard science disciplines, that consensus or truth, because this is a question I asked a long time ago when it came to the Kensington Roomstone. I said, look, I've written a, you know, I've done all this scientific work. I've looked at the language, the runes, dialect, grammar, all this stuff. I said, what is it? It's all consistent with authenticity. If I took this argument into a court of law, I would kick your ass. Okay. <laughs> right. You yeah. Honest to God, the other side wouldn't show up. Right. right. So this begs the question, what is truth? When does it become accepted? Who decides? What is the criteria? What is the bar? I mean, all this stuff, it's like, I mean, I can tell you that when I testify in a court of law, which I've done many times in my career, mm -hmm. um, I've never lost. And the reason isn't because I'm special. I would love for you to think that. <laughs> I have a client like Haley that the evidence doesn't go in her favor. I'm going to say, you know, you're a nice person. I love you to death, but you're going to lose this case. And I'm not going to lie for you. Okay. You you better settle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so my point is, is that who decides, right? And what, what I have found, is that in the academic world, and if there's academics listening to this interview, prove me wrong because I'm all ears. But basically, it, it, it boils down to they sit around and they argue about it, and then eventually they come to a consensus, right? Mm -hmm. When they all agree. What are the criteria for that consensus? Can you tell me what that is? And um, I have looked into this question, and I'm not getting much for an answer. Hmm. So this really goes to the heart of the whole historical narrative. And for the most part, is based on bullshit. <laughs> detail about this, but there was a point in time where I was associated with uh, a university-related, uh, an archaeology group that was university-related. Okay. I actually was kicked out for being associated with people from ancient aliens because I was working with people from ancient aliens and traveling with people from ancient aliens and doing research publicly with people from ancient aliens. And I was actually kicked out of this program because of my associations. That was, that was the letter I got from due to my associations, it wasn't going to look good for the program. Um, so forth and so on. And <laughs> it was just absolutely absurd. And I was, wow. just, there was just so much backlash I got for even suggesting, you know, for even just, communicating and working with these people and sharing ideas and doing research with them. I mean, it was just insane. That's the, I mean, that's the thing is that nobody wants to be proven wrong. You know, you, you studied this thing your whole entire life and you're, you know, you're uh, tenured and you're a professor and this is what the, this is what this is. And then somebody comes along and says, no, this isn't it. And you got to go, nobody goes, oh shit and eats their hat. They're they just defend it until the day they die. They're just like, no, this is, this is the truth and sad. And I well, think, go ahead. Go I was ahead. just going to say, I've just seen from the archaeological perspective, one of the reasons I wanted to get involved in archaeology was because I've just seen that there are so many people out there that are academics and archaeologists especially that are not out there to, to do their job as archaeologists and search for the truth. They're out there to further some other 
political agenda within the historical sphere. And it, it just blows my mind because what difference does it make to them if the history is telling a new story? Shouldn't that be exciting? Shouldn't we be happy to learn and move forward on these new discoveries? Why try to call everything a hoax that is actually a, a really exciting new chapter of history? Well, and, and, and you know, the other thing that really drives me crazy and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, when I was doing America on Earth, I had people accuse me of not understanding scientific method and <laughs> the laboratory for 30, 35 years straight. And that's all we do all day, every day. But, you know, here, here, the point I wanted to make is this, okay, let's say, let's say, you know, John, you had a, a theory about whatever, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And all of a sudden Haley comes up and she does some really good research or she uncovered something. She dug something up out of the ground. Right. They completely was at odds, refuted your previous conclusion, right? Right. right. So in certain academic circles, you would be pissed off and you would hate her and you would do everything you could to undermine her. And then you would get mad and it was all and nothing gets done. And this right? happens all the time. And it happens all the time. Oh. However, if you are a true scientist, okay, mm-hmm. and if new evidence comes in, that supports a different conclusion that makes what the information that you previously had obsolete. Right. You shouldn't take that as offense. It doesn't make you look stupid by accepting the new evidence, the new science that makes you look smart. Right. Right. Because that's how science works. New evidence may support a new conclusion. And if it does, you go there right. and you do that with a clear conscience and you don't, get all butthurt about it because, you know, your, your feelings were hurt and your previous work was undermined. And, and, and so when, when these people that can't handle that process, right. Accuse people like me of not being a scientist. I'm like, really? <laughs> really? I, I, mean, I think it comes down to money. Saying, I completely follow I mean, you. And I think it's it's it comes totally down to different mindset. And if you're a true scientist, you go where the evidence takes you. Yeah. Yeah. Of anything. Right. That's the way you're supposed to be. And I think what a lot of it, from what I understand for some of these academics, is they're afraid to lose their funding because it's funding is so tight. They're like, oh, we've been funded oh, yeah. to do this thing. And they're like, oh, my God, if, if this if this rock is true, then all of my next 10 years yeah. of funding is gone. <laughs> and I have to. And the do money else. and the money that I'm supposed to get to continue this, it's going to stop. Right. Yeah. That's the human element inserting itself. Right. More than it should. My number one, <clears throat> my number one. Um, complaint here is that a lot of academics and archaeologists will try to argue with the data. And Scott has seen this so much, I know for a fact, but it just drives me crazy that you have these academics out here that want to argue the data and say, oh, I don't believe this to be true. It's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of science. (laughs) It's not a matter of faith. It's a matter of evidence. I say that all the time. It's like people say to me, oh, you believe the Kensington runestone is real. I go, no, I don't believe anything. I've, I've been convinced by the data, right? It's not a matter of faith. And I have people say that to me all the time. They believe this. I've always believed in it. And, you know, I hate to, you know, I hate to poop on somebody's party, but <laughs> it's, it's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of evidence. And, you know, and, and this goes, this goes to the whole, the whole debate. Yeah. I'll, I'll do it again. I'll do it again right now on your show. Okay. All right. I'll challenge any academic. Any one of you to have an open public debate in any forum you want. All right. I will publicly debate the evidence for the Kensington runestone and you argue the evidence against it. Okay. And I'll tell you what, I've been saying this now for 10 years and you know how many people have taken me up on it? Frickin zero. (laughs) Because here's, here's the, the dirty little secret about forensics, all right? If we have all this evidence, factual evidence in the geology, the history, the runes, the dialect, the grammar, the dating, everything, right? Mm -hmm. The the whole thing. The story that we have written four books about that is consistent and conclusive. If that's all true, then how the hell can there possibly be evidence to support the contrary? The truth is, it can't exist. It doesn't exist. So any of you clowns out there that want to take me on, bring it. 
You know what's going to happen? When you start studying your case, a lawyer is going to look at you and say, you got nothing, dude. <laughs> and it's not going to happen. And it hasn't happened. So why do we have, why is it still a question? That's amazing. That's so awesome. I, Think about I, that. It, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And the thing that got really that really got me, Scott, was that I heard you in a lecture say this once: that you were you became a Mason after st studying the Kensington Runestone. Yeah, what, you weren't a Mason, and then this, because of the evidence, because of everything that led you to oh. all all of the data, everything, all the research, all the scientific research you've done on it, you were like, "Whoa, there's something here." And then you started researching masonry. And then after that, you were like, well, mate, yeah, I'm going to do this. And you jumped in and then you became a mason. And then, and then it only furthered yes. your scientific study and the data that you, you acquired years before you were a Freemason, right? Yeah. Well, you know what? It was, well, it was like, you know, when I think about the whole journey, I, I some ways I, I'm kind of like, geez, you know, it's too bad that that happened. But Actually, it's not too bad. It's great that that happened because it forced me to go down roads that I never would have gone down had I not been challenged, had I not been criticized, uh -huh. had I not been attacked. And, you know, the road led to the Templars and Freemasonry followed right behind it. And, you know what, I would have probably become a Mason a few years earlier, but I was so worried about perceptions, right? Our oh, right. Yeah. Bias because I'm a Mason. And I got to the point finally where I just said, you know what? Screw I don't give a shit what they think. I'm right. just going to do this for me, and um, because I'm going to tell the truth regardless. So that's awesome. Good for you, and thank you for doing that. Thank you for sticking to your guns and not letting people shit on you or, or say any of these things, and always you know, sticking up for the truth and for what's right. And the same for you, Haley. Thank you very much for doing everything you're doing, the book you're doing, the, the tour that to getting people's uh, enlightenment and getting everybody's uh, you know consciousness raised a little bit and discovering that hey. Maybe we're not the biggest thing in the world. Maybe there is this divine feminine that's above us. Maybe that's what the secret is all along. And maybe she's coming back. Maybe you're going to help it, you know, usher in the new age of Aquarius with her. And I think, you know, if I can play a tiny, the small part of it, man, I'm so grateful for the time that you guys have, have let me do that. And I really appreciate it. Seriously, thank you so much for everything you do. Scott, your books are amazing. Haley, your book is going to be, I, I know your book's amazing because I've read it, most of it. <laughs> well, I've seen I've seen it too, and I've, I've watched her. She's doing a great job. But you know what, John? We, we want to thank you because uh, it's one thing to do the research, but if you sit there in a vacuum and you don't get the word out, it's it 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 doesn't do anything. So it's important right. that you give us a platform here to do this. And uh, you know what? Not only do I think we're doing good work here, uh, we're having a hell of a lot of fun. Well, that's the most important part. You gotta have we a good said time. Cheap shit. How many times? <laughs> we laughed every time. <laughs> it never gets old. <laughs> It's but thank a, you, seriously. We no, really thank you. You're more, I mean, I, I'm honored and honest. If there's anything I can ever do, please let me know. I'm, I'm more than happy and excited to help you guys in any way I can for, through this whole entire thing. So it's, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be an awesome ride. And I'm glad that you let me tag along with it, at least this little part of it anyway. You bet. Man. Well, thank you for having us, John. It's always a pleasure. We always have so much fun. Yeah, let's do this more often. I can't wait. I, I, I can't wait to uh, hopefully we can do it from Scotland while I'm there. Yeah, you know, on the tour podcast from Lodge Zero Kill Winnie. Wow, that would be rad. Wouldn't that be something. That yeah. would be amazing. Now we got to put up. Now we got to produce. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we might be able to. If you wanted to do something like that, I, I think we might be able to. Who knows? Yeah, we might. We might be able to work something out. We'll figure something out. Yeah. That would be awesome. I, I even I will go for the cave with the sheep shit. E either way, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, you get it, that, happen. that cave is pretty badass, man. I'm telling you, you, you'll forget all about the sheep shit. You'll enjoy the game. <laughs> um, it's, it's so amazing that it's there. I mean, that just boggles my mind that it's just like, yeah, go ahead. You know, that the guy's just like, go ahead, just check yeah, it out. And I, I encountered that. I mean, I can't think, I can't think right now of any other places, but that has happened to me so many times. I have gone looking for caves, inscriptions. I mean, you name it, I've gone looking for it on other people's property here in Scotland. I mean, there's just so many amazing things to find and to take a look at here. It's just overwhelming sometimes, but yeah, we're really looking forward to this tour and to being able to share it with other people. And one of my favorite things about tours is when you take people to a site that have, that aren't, maybe aren't even familiar with the topic or with, with the content, their opinions and, and the things that they pick up, things that you might miss. And it's so right. fun getting to interact with the group and 
picking up on other people's interpretations and such things that you may have missed before. Never looked at that way. <laughs> That's amazing. I just, I just got a mental picture of somebody just going, well, what is that bit? <laughs> it's like, Oh, <laughs> and I don't know. Stepped over it 50 times. <laughs> oh, oh. Sheep shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've made the discovery. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Sheep shit. Oh no, the, the other day we were walking over something. And I said, Scott, wait, is that a carving? And he's like, Haley, that's a fern. <laughs> and I was just like, oh. <laughs> Exciting. Well, it did look like something for a second. For a second. <laughs> it was a like, fern oh. laying in a in rock there. Oh, anyway. yeah. No, that's awesome. No, thank you guys so much. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you.